my biggest piece of advice to a local business proprietor is stop acting alone. You don't have the bandwidth to do everything you need to do mm. to succeed. And so what you do need to do is bring in partners, some of your customers as co-owners of your business and also as helpers in the decision making in your business. And in bringing in lots of people as owners, you're actually also marketing your business well and you're turning those owners into your best sales force. Number two is partnerships with other businesses. And there are ways that businesses can work together and improve their competitiveness. Welcome to Rise Leaders Radio. I'm your host, Leanne Mallory. As a leadership coach, I work inside organizations and I focus on helping leaders achieve their whole person potential and meaningfully contribute to their organization's mission. With this podcast, I share leadership best practices, developmental approaches, and stories of exemplary leaders. Welcome to episode 30. This episode's topic is a bit different than others I've done so far. I'm very glad to be talking to Michael Schumann today about the importance of local business ownership to the local economy, and not just from the typical support local context. We're going to dip our toes into a more formal way to invest in local business as well, and then head you in a direction for learning more. Michael Schumann is an economist, attorney, author, and entrepreneur, and a leading visionary on community economics. He's director of local economy programs for Neighborhood Associates Corporation and an adjunct professor at Bard Business School in New York City. He's also a senior researcher for Council Fire, where he performs economic development analysis for states, local governments, and businesses around North America. And then to add to his titles and his talents, Michael has co-authored several books, uh, 10 to be exact. And the two most recent books are Put Your Money Where Your Life Is, How to Invest Locally Using Solo 401ks and Self-Directed IRAs, and The Local Economy Solution, How Innovative Self-Financing Pollinator Enterprises Can Grow Jobs and Prosperity. He also does a ton of speaking around the country on this topic, and I'm so glad, Michael, that you made time for me and our listeners today. Welcome. Great to be with you. Yeah, I'm really excited. This is a topic close to my heart, and I'm glad that we were introduced by a friend of ours to get this going. So I'd like to start with just how I became interested and moved to how you became interested in all of this. So I moved to an area of Dallas about three years ago where most of the businesses are locally owned. And most everything I need in daily life, I can walk to sometimes or I can find it right here. And I have really benefited from this sense of community and as, as I was reflecting on this this morning, really a sense of belonging in my community because of the local business ownership. And so that's my story. It's very relationship and community oriented. But I'm wondering how you got interested in this in this topic. Well, at one level, it's the same thing. It's all about the relationships, the intimacy, the pragmatism of doing things at a local level. I was graduated from law school in 1982, uh, immediately set up a nonprofit, and the mission of the nonprofit was to get cities involved in foreign policy. I felt like foreign policy was, in a way, the hardest issue to do at a grassroots level, and yet the grassroots content of policy often makes it a lot better. Um, and so I organized thousands of mayors and city council members around the country on issues ranging from Central America to human rights to 
ozone depletion in the upper atmosphere. And it was really successful. And I got interested in how to expand um, these tools of what we called municipal foreign policy into other realms. And I started to pay more attention to economic development and the ways in which the global economy were affecting cities and how cities could respond appropriately. And I started to understand that what was being talked about in terms of economic development was fundamentally wrong um, and fundamentally disadvantageous to locally owned businesses. And I quickly learned that the most important businesses in our economy are locally owned business. And yet our economic development policies have systematically disadvantaged them. So I became very interested in how to articulate a different strategy, philosophy, a, a tool chest for local governments to do economic development in a better way. So that's how I got started about 25 years ago. Okay. So two things that you said right there caught my attention. I want you to go deeper in. Um, one is how do you define a local business? Yeah, a local business could be understood in three different ways, um, by ownership, by control, or by proximity. Um, by ownership, it you know what, what we're looking for is, is there majority ownership of the business in the community in which it operates? And there are two definitions of doing this. One is just looking at the size of business and making a reasonable assumption about ownership. And by that analysis, about 60% of the private economy is locally owned. Another way of doing it is from Dun & Bradstreet, which is a, a private company that prepares a kind of massive index of all businesses. And they consider a business local if its headquarters is in the same state as the satellite office or factory or whatever is associated with it. And by that definition, 80% of the private economy is locally owned. Business. Interesting. So 60 to 80 percent. 60 to 80 percent. The way you look and, at it. And, and that's so that's just on the issue of ownership. Now, you could also say, well, what about control? Um, like a franchise, I could own a McDonald's franchise and it could be I could be local and the, the ownership could be local, but I will have no control over how to run that franchise. And so some people who are interested in local ownership might put that additional screen on it. Mm -hmm. And still another way people think about localism is the local supply chain. What is the distance of a piece of food and going from the farmer's field in order to your table? And if you can shorten that distance, then you've got local food. Excellent. All right. So those are some definitions of local, some different ways to look at it. Why do you think that those are so important? So on one hand, you've already said if 60 to 80 percent of locally business or the, just the business economy is concentrated in private ownership. So just economically, it makes sense. But what are the other reasons that local ownership is important to a community? Yeah, there, there are many reasons, but let's start with what I think is the most important, which is local businesses spend more of their money locally. They have exactly the kinds of local relationships you talked about a few minutes ago. And with those local relationships, what happens is, is that money stays in the economy and you get the multiplier effect, which generates more income, wealth, and jobs. And there have been about three dozen studies done looking at two similar businesses or two similar industries, one locally owned, one not. And they all show that for every dollar going into the local business or industry, you get two to four times the 
jobs and the income and the tax collection that what you would get from the non-local business or industry. And there is not a single study that has shown otherwise. Um, <laughs> I'll give you another example. I mean, there's a study published in the Harvard Business Review in the summer of 2010, and it's a regression analysis of communities across the United States. And it shows that in those communities with the highest density of locally owned business, there is the highest per capita job growth rate. And another study from the Federal Reserve in 2013 uh, shows that when you look at counties across the United States and those counties with the highest density of local owned business, there's the highest per capita income growth rate. So in other words, if you want to reduce poverty, raise social equality, local businesses are your best ticket for doing so. Okay. And then there's also for me, I think about how the the local businesses invest back into just the social, uh, the social structure. Again, that's more my my line of interest. And you know, I just look at different ways that they contribute to the society that they are a part of through volunteering, working through schools, supporting schools, et cetera. And it seems that the local businesses do more of that and they do it in a different way. They do it in a more personal way than larger corporations do. Even if they have a, a focus on contributing back to the community, there's just a different feel when a locally owned business does it than when a large organization does. And there are sociology studies that back you up on this hmm. and show that in communities with a high density of locally owned business, there are higher rates of volunteership, higher rates of voting, higher rates of engagement in charities, higher rates of social stability. So we could spend the entire right. uh, call just going through this mountain of evidence about why locally owned businesses are the best bet for <laughs> economic development. The work that I do is I do leadership development work and organizational development work. And I'm wondering on the flip side, so from the standpoint of the business owner, what would you recommend that local business owners do to maybe even self-promote more, you know, show the value that they're bringing? A lot of these things that we're talking about, I didn't realize until I really started digging into it. And I think that there's a lost opportunity there. Yeah. So I think my biggest piece of advice to a local business proprietor is stop acting alone. You don't have the bandwidth to do everything you need to do mm. to succeed. And so what you do need to do is bring in partners. Number one, partners in your ownership. So I would bring in some of your customers as co-owners of your business and also as helpers in the decision making in your business. And there's ways of doing that where you don't lose control. You can issue, for example, preferred shares of stock. And in bringing in lots of people as owners, you're actually also marketing your business well and you're turning those owners into your best sales force. So that's that's number one. Number two is partnerships with other businesses. And there are ways that businesses can work together and improve their competitiveness. So for example, in Tucson, there are a group of local food businesses called Tucson Originals. And this has been happening for nearly 20 years. They collectively buy foodstuffs, kitchen equipment and dishes and by buying things collectively they bring down the unit costs and make themselves more competitive if you go to switzerland there are groups of local businesses in a network called the veer and the veer is all about a mutual credit network so that businesses have more access to capital than they would as compared to just going one by one to a bank this, in a way, cuts against the a way the, a lot of entrepreneurs see themselves as the rugged individual mm -hmm. who will succeed on his or her own. But I think this, having been through a leadership training program myself 30 <laughs> years ago, I know 
good leadership requires lots of partnership and collaboration. Yes. And again, as you're speaking, I'm just visualizing my own community and the community, the local business owners. And I wanted to ask you about this. What I'm seeing in our community, lots of female small business ownership, and I'm seeing a lot of collaboration between those and their younger women, maybe 20s, early 30s, and they market together, they do social media together, they put together events, you know, in, in their particular location and say, you know, we're doing this on this weekend, here are the participating businesses. And I wonder if that's a trend as well. Yeah, I think you can say that not just women, but also in other communities, in the African-American community, in the Latino community, because so many of the conventional routes to economic success are still tilted against them, entrepreneurship is one way they can move forward. And here's an interesting statistic. I mean, it's in a slightly different domain, but I think about your point, and that is that investment crowdfunding has been legal in the United States for four years. Uh, and what we've seen with investment crowdfunding is a half million Americans put about $370 million into 1,500 businesses. The most disproportionately successful businesses have been those run by women and people of color. Those are the ones who have welcomed in grassroots ownership, grassroots partners, and also it represents the people who were locked out of the conventional capital markets. So I, yes, I do think that hmm. all of these outgroups are innovating in a different and exciting way. That is different and exciting. And since you've kind of moved into this domain of investment. Let's just go there because this was, I know that your latest book is really focused on how to invest in local business. And one way, which is shop local, which by the way, I want to say this is airing on December 1st. And I would just want to put a plug in to anyone who is doing any holiday shopping to uh, shop local, shop small. So that was very intentional about the timing of the release of this episode. So I just want to put that plug in and then back back out of that again and say, when we're talking about broader investment and what we think of as more traditional long-term investing, there are ways that we can invest in small businesses through more sort of traditional but innovative instruments. And I'd like for you to talk about that generally, kind of just ideally what that means, and then narrow it down because I'm also interested in how do we do that? If we were interested in investing that way, how would we make that happen? Right. So here's one thing that I do when I speak to audiences that uh, often creates a sense of dissonance and shock. Um, <laughs> so I, I present to them data, as we talked about, that 60 to 80% of the private business marketplace by jobs and output is in locally owned business. I show them data that these businesses are actually uh, at least as profitable and competitive as those traded on the stock exchange. And then I ask, by show of hands, how many people here are putting 1% of their pension funds into locally owned business? And all the hands go down. And what it shows is that all of us are systematically over-investing, most of us, frankly, exclusively investing in the Fortune 500 companies that we're not so connected to. And investing or not investing at all in the local businesses we know with overwhelming evidence are the key to our prosperity hmm. so <clears throat> it's kind that, of a no-brainer huh when you look at it no that way it's a no-brainer but it raises the question how did we get here and this is where i had to dust off my law degree and look at securities laws that were enacted in the early Jurassic period during the uh, last <laughs> depression. And the securities laws basically made it exceedingly 
difficult and expensive for the vast majority of us who are so-called unaccredited, non-accredited investors to put even a penny into locally owned business. What has changed in the last 10 years is a variety of tools like crowdfunding that make it cheaper and easier for businesses to either take a loan from their fan base or to sell stock to them or to establish royalty agreements. And so it really is a game changer. And I think that bringing in local capital, as I said, not only connects you to the business, not only fortifies the business, but also is good in terms of thing and the buy local activity. I mean, when you look at a co-op, the people who shop at the co-op are the members of the Mm co-op. That's not a surprise. And even if there's like slight discounts at a store right next door to the co-op, they continue to buy at the co-op because they get a financial reward uh, at the end of the year from their co-op. And it's the same thing with local ownership. Local ownership cements good purchasing behavior. And so how do we make that happen? So I think the way that we make it happen is move a small amount of our pension funds, maybe 1% per year from the non-local business to local business. And the way to do that is the topic of my most recent book, Put Your Money Where Your Life Is, and that is to use these very uh, well-established tax tools the self-directed IRA, and the solo 401k, and gradually move your money from other places where you have it, traditional IRAs or traditional 401ks or 403bs, and moving that money into your own control, and then you can invest that money locally. So say more about how that works. So I move it into my own control and invest it locally. Go down another level for me there. Yeah, so let's go to Port Townsend. So Port Townsend is one of my favorite local investment communities in the United States. Um, And about 12 years ago, they set up something called LION, the Local Investment Opportunity Network, which is a monthly gathering of business businesses and potential investors. And they meet and they learn about what are business opportunities for investing. And just those relationships have facilitated about a million dollars of local investing per year in a 10,000 person community. So take your community, population divide by 10,000, you know, multiply that, by a million dollars and that's what you could receive every year in additional capital for your business. Now, the way they did it in Port Townsend is just using the traditional tools where a business can up to some limit uh, sell some securities to friends or family so they fell into the friends category. But crowdfunding enables you to go to the public and what you do if you're a business, is you go to one of 40 plus federally licensed portals. These are basically websites like WeFunder, Honeycomb Credit. You work with them to provide some paperwork. It's not very demanding or difficult. And then you let your fan base know that you're on one of these federal portals and all of your fans can put in as much as $2,200 per year. And they can put it in as debt or as stock or as a royalty agreement, however you set it up. And this is how you can transact the local ownership relationship quickly, efficiently, and inexpensively. I think that I'm remembering now, I can't remember if it was in our prior conversation or in your book, where you actually describe this like as a bridge, So on one side, you have the investors. On the other side, you have the local businesses. And they're both kind of initiating or participating from their sides, but coming together in the middle for these opportunities for investment. That's right. And it's a bridge that right now requires a lot more energy and uh, commitment than it would if you were just investing in Wall Street. Because 
if you're investing in Wall Street, you've got a bunch of mutual funds. You've got things like, you know, TD Ameritrade, which allows you to instantly set up an IRA, and then you can start investing in either individual stocks or funds. And then you've got things like Moody's and Standard & Poor's that give you information about all these securities. All these little pieces of information and helpers are not quite available in the local investment universe. Yet. So, we hope. Yet. Yet. <laughs> and that's that's I think that will change. But let's just take a simple example like funds. If you don't have the time and energy to vet local investments one by one, and you're also a little nervous about putting all of your money in one stock, you want diversification, you really want a fund, a community investment fund. And it turns out there's about 20 of them around the country. Funds like Pioneer Valley Grows, which is with local food businesses in Western Massachusetts, or the New Hampshire Community Loan Fund, which helps trailer park residents buy the land under their trailer parks and stabilize their housing, or the East Bay Permanent Real Estate Cooperative, which deals with affordable housing in Oakland. So you can find these funds, but they're rare. Mm -hmm. And we're going to have to see a lot more of them to facilitate local investing. I wonder if we'll find uh, more financial planners and wealth managers getting more conversant and familiar with these so that they can help direct that. And if we might even see firms that focus more on that entirely, you know, that they have a whole arm of their business because that is their commitment and their kind of ethos is to support that. Yes, I think we will. And I wrote about a couple of these financial planners in my book. And then I did a blog about a month ago with okay. this, a wealth management site, which is attracts a lot of financial planners. And I basically made the argument, this is a field ripe for innovation and early takers are going to make the most money there. And people really responded very positively because I think almost every financial planner worth their salt is asked by someone that they're working with, what about this local investment opportunity? And they really are not well equipped right now to answer that question properly, but with some training, they could be. And so again, there's uh, that on the investment side. And then I can imagine you've mentioned like Port Townsend and in Tucson that the businesses themselves get together and they collaborate on ways to create these funds that can be a portal that people can go to for their own investing. So it's again, it's on both sides. We need to be looking for it as investors and then the business owners, if they're taking initiative on their end so they can have more working capital and more investment in their organizations locally, that they're doing that as well. Yeah, I think a lot of businesses can take the initiative with this. Um, and we go back to the point we talked about earlier, which is that it's pretty hard for one local business, especially a small one, to take this initiative in his or her own. But if you have a collection of 20 or 50 or 100 businesses working together, these are problems that can be solved. And and. I feel like the COVID-19 pandemic has been an invitation to local businesses who've been struggling to think about how to pursue their business model a little bit differently, a little bit more collaboratively. Yeah, it's another kind of pivot. We saw a lot of pivoting at a very operational level, and now we've got this kind of broader scale there's also this, how do we structure our business and allow investing is a broader pivot. Right. I agree. And if I were a retailer right now, I would look for ways of moving more of my business into home delivery. I wouldn't do that on my own. I would work with other local businesses to set up a delivery service. A good example of that is called Pickfly in Phoenix, Arizona, but it's happening all over the country. Mm -hmm. And people say, well, Amazon's doing it. 
well, okay, Amazon's doing it for global goods. You can do it for local goods. Amazon can deliver you something in a day. Your local delivery service might be able to get you something in a two or three hours. So there's a an example that I think of here. We have a local organization called Turn Compost, and we subscribe to this composting service. And so they're already out on a daily and weekly basis picking up compost. And so, and they are working on uh, being a delivery arm also. So they're out and about anyway. So you can order online from their store and they will deliver to you items, baked goods, you know, all, all different types of goods. You can order from their site and since they're dropping by your house anyway, and so you can make that exchange. So is that an example of that kind of partnership with local delivery and, and retail? Absolutely. And, and I think that, I mean, it's worth saying that this trend has been happening for a long time before COVID. You can see it, for example, in bookstores. Local independent bookstores were having a terrible time partially because of Amazon, partially because of big box stores like Borders and Barnes and Noble. So they started to change their business model and their business model no longer became buying books. It became creating cultural gathering places, the third spots in the neighborhood, the places where kids would come together and there'd be classes and clubs and, you know, food to support that. And with that little tweak of the business model, uh, local bookstores actually began expanding again about three or four years ago. And now with COVID, you know, you've got to innovate again. So no business can ever stand still and expect to cling to the same model forever. I mean, even IBM sort of learned that. So, you know, big and small businesses have to continually innovate. And by the way, we know that local businesses, small businesses uh, generate more patents per dollar invested in them than larger businesses. So I expect them to innovate. Interesting. So it feels like that we have come full circle here. And I, uh, Michael, I really appreciate the work that you're doing. And I want to make sure and say that in the show notes, I'm going to link to your blog, into your books, into your website, because there's a lot of great stuff there. And I think it's really, really interesting. And I suspect that we're going to see the trend continue and that these investment instruments become more common. But we've got a hump to get over before that happens. Yeah, I think all of us have got to slowly change our habits and businesses will pop up to make it easier for us to do this. And like we talked about, you know, local registered advisors, local funds, local stock exchanges even. I think all of those things will happen in the next 10 or 20 years and we're going to see a dramatic change. And it's something to get quite excited about because it means that as communities, we're going to prosper more. Our communities are going to look better. They're going to be stronger and we're going to feel better about ourselves. I agree. I agree. Again, thank you so much for your time this morning, for the work that you're doing. I've really appreciated this, and I'm now reading all of your books. It's a whole new portal for me in just learning more about the economy and what I can do, and it's just interesting. It's, it's, it's a whole new world. Well, I appreciate that, and my children's college tuition bills appreciate it as well. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Great. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. If you like what you heard today, subscribe to Rise Leaders Radio on your preferred podcast platform. Your ratings, reviews, and shares are also really appreciated. You can also visit rise-leaders.com for all the resources we talked about today and to work with me if you're committed to making your unique and positive impact. Thank you for listening and remember, elevate your part of the world. Music